This episode is sponsored by DataCamp. Start building your data science and analytics skills by clicking the link in the description. Meteorites are incredibly valuable to planetary scientists, because right now they're basically the only bits of the solar system that we get to touch that are not like Earth bits or Moon bits. But interpreting them is kind of like being a cosmic crime scene investigator. Each step of a meteorite's journey, from the collision that knocked it towards Earth to its violent impact with the ground, has shaped it physically and chemically. So disentangling what bumps and bruises came from which event is huge in unlocking a meteorite's most valuable secrets. And last week, in a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, an international team unearthed a new clue about the origin of one of the most important groups of meteorites. That clue? Microscopic layers hidden within nanodiamonds. The paper investigates meteorites called urolites. For more than 100 years, astronomers have known that many of these space rocks contain oodles of microscopic diamonds. But before you get too excited, know that these diamonds are seriously small. In some samples, they can be less than 20 nanometers across, which is dozens of times smaller than the smallest bacteria. Still, planetary scientists have long puzzled over where they came from, because diamonds don't just pop into existence. They require tremendous pressure to form. In fact, past studies have suggested that urolite nanodiamonds may have required pressures of up to 20 gigapascals. That's reachable only through large, like, Mercury or Mars-sized protoplanets, which is like a developing planet. So many researchers have proposed that that's where urolites came from, a single parent body like a protoplanet that's long since broken up. But this new paper digs deeper. In it, the researchers analyzed three urolite samples, and they found some of the largest meteorites diamonds ever, with some ranging up to a tenth of a millimeter across. But they also found lonsdalite, a type of diamond where the carbon atoms are arranged a little differently. And that's big news, because lonsdalite doesn't form through long periods of steady pressure, like you'd find in a protoplanet. It forms through brief moments of extreme stress. On top of that, the researchers found that other minerals in the meteorites also seem to have experienced intense pressure shocks. Now, every meteorite lives through at least one point of shock when it smacks into the ground. But these rocks would vaporize before reaching a high enough pressure to form diamonds. So according to the authors, the most likely explanation here is that urolites and their diamonds didn't just form inside some parent body. They formed because of a collision between that body and something else. This scenario means that the original body could have been smaller than Mercury or Mars, since the collision itself would create really large pressures. And that's an important clue in understanding what sorts of objects were floating around in the early solar system. We know there had to be planet-sized objects out there, because, like, they're still here. But how many there were is still up for debate. And this discovery suggests it could have been fewer than we think. In other news, we also got some clues to a different cosmic mystery recently, how the first supermassive black holes got to be so massive. The news came from a paper published on September 10th in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. In it, scientists were reported that they'd been studying the environment around an ancient supermassive black hole. And they found something exciting. The black hole was surrounded by a web of galaxies. And that could help us learn how this thing formed in the first place. Overall, the existence of supermassive black holes in the early universe is an enduring mystery. Take the one studied in this paper, for example. It's so far away, and its light has taken so long to get to us, that we're seeing it as it looked just 900 million years after the Big Bang. But already, it's around a billion times more massive than the Sun. That's one heck of an appetite, and we're not sure how that would happen. One idea is that black holes just collapse directly from giant clouds of gas and dust in the early universe. Another is that they start small and grow by merging with other black holes. And a third is that a small black hole grows not just through mergers, but by pulling in the material around them. That's the hypothesis best supported by this new paper. See, the supermassive black hole they study isn't just surrounded by six galaxies. Those galaxies are embedded in an enormous region dense with gas. It has a diameter
diameter more than 300 times larger than the Milky Way, and computer models suggest all that gas is organized in long, web-like filaments. Then it's all held together by the powerful gravity of a trillion solar masses of dark matter. The six satellite galaxies likely grew where the strands of gas intersect, forming new stars out of the abundant material. And the black hole is probably also at the intersection of the web, meaning gas flowing along it can get funneled right into it, helping it grow. And that would explain how it got so massive so fast. But that said, discoveries like these are also at the outer limits of what modern telescopes can observe, so astronomers will need to find more of these structures before they're sure that this hypothesis is the right one. Still, overall, this week really highlights the enormous range of astronomy, from diamonds a few billionths of a meter wide to webs trillions of times larger than the sun. And it's a reminder that despite everything we know, there is still a lot to learn. In astronomy research or anything else, sorting through and analyzing data is vitally important. And if you want to learn some data science skills, DataCamp has you covered. They have a bunch of courses where you can learn everything from data theory to using Excel and Python. And all their lessons are pretty short, so you can learn in a way that fits your schedule on whatever device you want. If you're new to all this, you might want to try their Introduction to Data Engineering course, which is only a few hours long and gives you an overview of the entire field. Right now, DataCamp has more than 330 courses and 250 instructors, and a subscription starts at only $25 per month, with unlimited desktop and mobile access. If you want to check them out, you can click the link in the description and get the first chapters of every course for free.